him and his family are starting to get his childhood back. The brain implant that can control epileptic seizures. Quite honestly, we wouldn't have been able to get through this past year if there wasn't hope. The ALS research giving hope to people with a debilitating disease and the benefits a patient gets by staying awake during kidney surgery. Welcome to Ion Health, where we focus on stories that affect your physical and mental well-being. I'm Michael George. We begin with a warning from the nation's top doctor. U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy is declaring gun violence a public health crisis, pointing to the fast-growing number of injuries and deaths involving guns in this country. Natalie Brand has details from Washington. With too many summer weekends ending with a staggering tally of shootings across the U.S., the nation's top doctor, Vivek Murthy, says enough is enough. My hope is that if we understand this as a kid's issue, that we will raise it on the priority list, that we will see it not as a political issue, but as a public health issue that should concern all of us. A landmark advisory from Dr. Vivek Murthy sounds the alarm that gun violence is now the leading cause of death for children and teens. And more than half of adults say they or a family member have experienced a gun-related incident. We don't have to live like this. And I lay out a series of strategies in this advisory that can help us reduce the profound toll of gun violence and help recognize that this is an issue that's infiltrated the psyche of America. The 40-page document calls for solutions from stricter gun laws, including a ban on assault weapons, to community involvement, even talking about safe gun storage at the doctor's office. The NRA says the answer is to prosecute criminals and not restrict gun rights. Does something need to change with respect to laws that help keep people safe from gun violence? Sure, I think that um, there needs to be a bigger focus on giving DAs and prosecutors the tools they need to put dangerous criminals where they belong, and that's in jail behind bars. The Surgeon General says gun violence is also taking a toll on mental health. He says nearly 80% of adult Americans stress about the possibility of a mass shooting and half of all high school age kids worry about a shooting in their school. And gun violence has now become the leading cause of death among kids and teens. That was not true a decade ago or two decade ago, decades ago, but it is true today. Following the massacre at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, that killed 19 children and two adults in 2022, Congress passed bipartisan gun safety legislation, the first major federal bill to address the issue in 30 years. But since then, additional measures have stalled in a divided Congress. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Washington. The World Health Organization says an unacceptably high number of people are dying from drug and alcohol use. In a new report, the WHO says more than 3 million people died from alcohol and drug use in 2019. About 80 percent were men. Europe and Africa have the two highest rates of alcohol-related deaths. The level of alcohol consumption per capita among drinkers amounts to average of 27 grams of pure alcohol per day which is roughly equivalent to two glasses of wine, two bottles of beer, or two servings of spirits. The debate on how much alcohol is too much will be spilling into Washington next year. That's when the Agriculture and Health and Human Services Departments will be updating federal dietary guidelines on alcohol consumption. They'll get input from experts who have done studies pointing to any amount of alcohol being harmful. Right now, it's recommended men have no more than two drinks daily and women have no more than one. People are now starting to question whether the science that those guidelines were based on is still valid. Julie Wernow writes about health and medicine for the Wall Street Journal. She says the alcohol industry and its allies on Capitol Hill are pushing back against possible changes. A lot of congressmen who are you know, in places from Napa Valley to, you know, the Bourbon Trail, whose economic engines are tied to the alcohol industry, questioning, you know, this process. The WHO says no level of alcohol consumption is safe, in part because it's associated with at least seven types of cancer. Summer has only just started, yet there's already been more than a dozen deaths blamed on rip currents, including six people along Florida beaches over a two-day period. According to the U.S. Life Saving Association, about 100 people drown every year due to rip currents. You can have a rip current develop anywhere at any time. 
Beach Safety Director for Panama City Beach, Daryl Paul, says to stay calm if you're in a rip current, which is a powerful, narrow channel of water that can move at speeds of up to eight feet per second. If you're a good swimmer, swim parallel to shore. But if you're not a very good, confident swimmer, uh, and all you can do is float, just float and wait for help. The U.S. Life Saving Association estimates the chances of drowning at a lifeguard protected beach are extremely rare. But many beaches and community pools are struggling to find enough lifeguards to keep people safe. Experts say there are numerous reasons for the shortage, including the pandemic disrupting training programs and the notion that lifeguarding is usually viewed as a summer job and not a profession. The CDC in Atlanta has found that the drowning rate is actually increasing in the United States. And we think the lifeguard shortage has a lot to do with that. In North Carolina, lifeguards rescued more than 160 people in rip currents over a five-day period. The CDC is warning of a heightened risk of dengue fever in a new alert to the public and health care providers. Countries in the Americas have already reported more than 9.7 million cases this year. That's twice as many than all of 2023. Before you have the first symptoms, you're already infectious to other mosquitoes. Dr. Eileen Marty is an infectious disease expert in Miami-Dade County, Florida. She says higher temperatures caused by climate change are giving mosquitoes a better chance to thrive. If you get up to temperatures in the 90s, the the reproduction rate is different. The, the amount of time that it takes for an egg to mature within the female goes down, so she's going to be laying eggs sooner. In addition, the time that it takes from, becoming an e from being an egg, going through larva, pupa, and adult, takes much less time. Instead of something like 30 days, we're talking about six to seven days. In addition to that, the virus inside the mosquito grows at much higher rates. So any infected mosquito is likely to have a much higher dose of virus and they have it that much sooner. About one in four people infected with dengue will get sick. Symptoms include aches and pains, nausea, vomiting and a rash. And in rare occasions it can turn deadly. The CDC is expanding lab capacity to improve testing and collaborating with local health departments to strengthen surveillance and prevention strategies. A Chicago man is the recipient of a new kidney transplanted while he was awake. Jared Hill shows us the surgery that could open doors for patients at higher risk for general anesthesia. Are you awake, John? Your renal failure is cured, my friend. Let's go. It's not every day a patient and doctor have a conversation in the middle of surgery. Last month, surgeons at Northwestern Medicine performed one of the first awake kidney transplants on 28-year-old John Nicholas. This kidney's going to make a lot of urine, John, yeah. so you're going to have to drink a lot of liquids, okay? Okay, I can do. Nicholas had chronic kidney disease since 2013 and says it was a matter of when, not if, he would need a transplant. His childhood best friend became the donor and doctors approached Nicholas about the awake part about a month and a half before surgery. I spoke with the two surgeons for about half an hour um, and I was, I was sold on the idea. Nicholas was given a spinal epidural, nerve block and light sedation. He says he didn't feel anything in his lower body during the surgery. I asked, you know, at one point, you know, hey, are, are you guys, when are you going to get started? And they were like, oh, yeah, we've already been working for a while. The best way I can equate it is a C-section for a woman who's about to have a baby. Dr. Satish Nadig says awake surgery decreases the risk of general anesthesia and gets patients home faster. It can really open the door to so many more people that have kidney failure that can make their major operation that they're gonna undergo more of an overnight procedure. Nicholas was discharged the next day with nothing stronger than an over-the-counter pain reliever. Hopefully there'll be a lot of other people like me. Northwestern Medicine has already identified five more patients for the awake surgery and hope the method can improve more lives. Jared Hill, CBS News. About 30,000 people in the U.S. have the debilitating disease ALS, and a new partnership is giving hope to patients and their families. The goal is to bring together resources to address the challenges patients and doctors face. We took a look at this new research initiative. Dave Schulman was having trouble buttoning his shirt. After months of tests, the 45-year-old father of two was diagnosed with ALS last year. I mean, it's horrendous. You see your life flashing before your eyes and 
you fast forward to the inevitable. The progressive and eventually fatal neurological condition, also called Lou Gehrig's disease, robs patients of the ability to walk, talk, eat, and breathe. Dave now has severe weakness in his arms and hands and slower walking and speech. The disease is relentless and it just keeps progressing. It hurts, especially when you hear that there's really no treatment. He's grateful to be part of a new research initiative he hopes can change that. Accelerating Medicine's partnership in ALS is building the largest data platform for research, bringing together not just scientists, but also patients and families. To be able to develop great diagnostic tests for ALS to find targets for new medicines that would actually change the course or possibly even cure this disease. Dr. Julie Gerberding is president and CEO of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. What we're looking for in ALS are biomarkers because early diagnosis really makes a difference to patients. But we're also looking for biomarkers that might give hints about what are the most likely approaches to treatment. About 4,000 to 6,000 new cases of ALS are diagnosed each year. My hope for the future is that one day, you know, someone sits there like I did last year and gets the ALS diagnosis and instead of being told, get your affairs in order, you're told, here's the treatment path. Quite honestly, we wouldn't have been able to get through this past year if there wasn't hope. The Shulmans also want other families to know they're not alone. Coming up, an app predicting depression in pregnant women. And there's a handheld device that doctors hope will make fighting cataracts as easy as a quick office visit. Welcome back. More than 200 million Americans have gotten at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine since they first debuted three years ago. The vaccines have proven to be safe and effective by health agencies around the world. Yet there's a lot of bad information out there suggesting otherwise. Previous studies have found that social media plays a big role in that. And new research says the posts that have had the most impact are ones that are misleading rather than obviously fake, like about microchips in the vaccine. To learn more about this, I spoke with study author Jennifer Allen, a recent PhD graduate from the MIT Sloan School of Management. First off, thanks so much for joining us. So uh, your study looked at misinformation specifically when it came to the vaccine. What did you find? We analyzed causal experiments and actually real world Facebook data, trying, uh, which, which uh, analyzed what people were actually seeing on the platform. And we found that despite all of this focus on, you know, false stories and outright misinformation, um, it was actually mainstream stories that covered rare deaths following vaccination in really misleading terms um, that had uh, the largest effect on vaccine hesitancy. And so we call these kinds of stories that are not factually inaccurate, aren't false, uh, we call them vaccine skeptical. And these vaccine skeptical stories actually had 50 times the impact of the outright false uh, misinformation stories. We all know people who say, I heard that the vaccine does this on Facebook, or I heard on YouTube that it's dangerous. How do we counter misinformation? I mean, I think it's a really tricky problem. Um, and, you know, I think the easiest way to counter misinformation is to make sure that people don't see it in the first place. You know, platforms could do more. Uh, you know, content moderation is obviously really hard. It's always a trade off between freedom of expression and, um, you know, the potential for harm. But I think that there are creative solutions that exist, um, one of which is uh, community content moderation, like we see on. Uh, Twitter, you know, X now, uh, community notes, where people in the community can um, provide additional context on posts that are potentially misleading, and other members of the community can then upvote those posts as being helpful. And I think this is a, you know, potential uh, exciting solution that balances, you know, freedom of expression, um, where uh, still providing context uh, for these misleading stories before they kind of get out of hand. Are there places that people should go for correct information or can misinformation really come from anywhere? I think, yeah, misinformation can come from anywhere. 
Um, and I, I don't think that this is uh, the intention of mainstream media outlets um, in particular. And I don't know if we would necessarily call these stories uh, outright misinformation in the same way as we would call, you know, a story claiming their microchips in the vaccine are. But I think that it's true that these stories can really misinform people. And, you know, mainstream media needs to be careful when they write their stories uh, to understand that, you know, most people on social media are not clicking in to read the story. 90% of people just, you know, see the headlines. And they need to be defensive um, in making sure that their, their stories are not going to be misinterpreted um, by, by the public um, and, or even misrepresented by bad actors who are, you know, using kind of accurate stories and cherry picking them to support a misleading narrative about the vaccines being dangerous. Well, thanks so much for sharing the results of your study with us. We appreciate it. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. Researchers at the University of Pittsburgh developed an algorithm that can predict moderate to severe depression in pregnant women. More than 900 women self-reported risk factors through an app during their first trimester. And the algorithm was about 90% accurate in predicting first-time depression later in pregnancy. The sooner that we know someone's at risk for depression, the earlier we can offer different preventive care options. Study author Dr. Tamar Krishnamurti found that certain factors were key. Worrying about financial stability or running out of food, um, concerns about an individual's ability to kind of manage their ongoing health problems. And we, we found that some worries that were specific to pregnancy were predictive. So things like feeling stressed about their upcoming labor and delivery or worrying about how the new baby might affect um, their interpersonal relationships. About 15% of women develop depression during pregnancy. Cataracts is the leading cause of blindness worldwide, affecting more than 20 million people in the U.S. With June being Cataract Awareness Month, we look at a new device that's helping restore patient sight. When you find out you're losing your eyesight, it's terrifying. John Gingrich is battling retinitis pigmentosa, a hereditary disease that's caused the 47-year-old to gradually lose his vision. I'm legally blind and I need a blind cane to get around. Um, my peripheral vision is completely gone. Gingrich is an author and magazine editor, two jobs that rely on sight. The disease can cause cataracts, which threaten to take what central vision he has left away. It hit a breaking point and I had to, this was something I had to do. It's really expected within a year. Gingrich came to Dr. Kira Manousis at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary of Mount Sinai. It's among the first hospitals using a device called MyCore to remove his cataracts. There's a throttle here which we can press to take the cataract out of the eye. It breaks it up into little pieces right on, at the tip. Cataract surgery is common, but this handheld device approved by the FDA last year makes the procedure faster and easier. This gives us the ability to break up the cataract using a different type of energy, it's subsonic energy. The less energy you use, the less inflammation, the better the patient can see the next day. Gingrich says his procedure was over in 10 minutes and made a huge difference. My central vision is fantastic. It's allowed me to write. It's allowed me to do my work. It's allowed me to walk my daughter to school in the mornings. Gingrich knows his disease will one day take his vision, but for now, the difference he's seeing is night and day. After the break, what inspired these two young girls to help hospital patients around the world? And why this man is proud to finally be able to donate blood. back. For years, gay and bisexual men were not able to give life-saving blood because the FDA banned donations during the 1980s HIV AIDS crisis. But the rules were lifted last year. And as Danya Backus shows us, during this Pride Month, one man is helping make blood donation more inclusive. Ralph Galvan has been a volunteer with the American Red Cross for 10 years, but it wasn't until last year that he was able to donate blood. I felt really good and really good that, you know, uh, we're not on the sidelines anymore. As a gay man, Ralph couldn't give blood based on rules the Food and Drug Administration had in place that kept sexually active gay or bisexual men from donating. To help change that policy, he took part in an FDA-funded study that led to requirement changes. Being part of the advanced study and helping shape this, and getting rid of the policy, 
um, it's beneficial to me, to my community. Last year, the FDA lifted restrictions. Guidelines are no longer based on sexual orientation, and all potential donors receive the same standard donor history questionnaire. This is really exciting because we're now able to ask every potential donor the same questions, treating them with equality and with respect, um, all while still maintaining a safe blood supply. Right now, officials say there is a critical need. Last month, the Red Cross collected 20,000 fewer donations than needed to maintain its national supply. Unfortunately, throughout the summer months, we know that we can only expect more severe weather and record setting travel, uh, which is going to further impact the ability of people to come out for their appointments. Ralph is grateful he can make a difference. It's a heartfelt moment that, you know, that I can give now and help others. And he is proud to say he is now a volunteer and donor. Donya Backus, CBS News, Los Angeles. In between homework and trips to the Jersey Shore, a pair of sisters spend time in their basement sewing hospital gowns for children. 13-year-old Juliana remembers the drab green gown their one-year-old cousin had on as she battled brain cancer in 2017. So my family had purchased her a hospital gown with like fun prints, like it had Disney on it and like princesses and stuff. So then I had went to a sewing camp over the summer the next year um, and then I remembered that I had noticed that about the hospital gowns and I realized that I wanted to do something to help kids like her. Since that moment Juliana and her 11 year old sister Audrina have sewn and donated more than 1800 gowns of various colors and patterns. I like feel great. I love when like I could help out because I like seeing the smile on the kids' faces even though they're going through such a hard time. Local businesses have chipped in to help the girls, including a hospital linen company that cleans the gowns before they're sent to patients, especially important for kids with weak immune systems. There's like always something small you could do to make a difference. Like it doesn't have to be anything big. It could just be something like really simple. The gowns have been given to patients in 36 states and even Uganda with three more African nations set to receive some later this year. A young boy has become the first person in the world fitted with a brain implant to control epilepsy seizures. The device is giving hope to others who have the condition and don't respond to drugs. Lee Kinairi has the story from London. Oren Nolson was just three years old when he had his first seizure. The form of epilepsy he has brings on episodes every day and night. His mom, Justine, says he lost his childhood. Thank you. Every moment of his life is affected because of his epilepsy. Last year, the 12-year-old took part in a trial. A neurotransmitter was fitted onto his skull to generate deep brain stimulation. Screw ready for the plate. Dr. Martin Tisdall is his surgeon. When you have an epileptic seizure, it's essentially uncontrolled abnormal electrical activity and we can block that activity by sending down these very quick pulses of, of current and they disrupt the activity and therefore stop the seizures. Six months after his surgery, Oren's daytime seizures had decreased by 80 percent. How has this changed Oren's day-to-day -day life? Him and his family are starting to get his childhood back. Tisdall hopes the device can help more of the 25 percent of people with epilepsy who don't respond to drugs. We really hope that by doing this research and understanding more about how deep brain stimulation works and who it works for, we'll be able to offer a new treatment option. For now, Oren's mom says this treatment greatly improved the quality of his life. Now the future looks brighter. Oren's journey is not over. His medical team hopes to fine tune his device to eventually stop him from having any seizures at all. Lee Lee Canary, CBS News. London. That's this week's Eye on Health. I'm Michael George. Thanks for joining us and be well.